Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Manny Castro. I'm the Technical Services Specialist at Siegel Scientific, authors of Bartender. In today's webinar, we'll be building a database integration. We will be connecting to a Microsoft SQL Server database and go through how fields in a table can select the label, the printer, and then populate your label. We'll also cover what exactly triggers this event to occur and the options you have available to you. So now before we discuss the specific integration that we will be building today, let's quickly cover three of the main components that make up your integration. At this point, your label or labels are designed and you're ready to integrate with your system or other software. The three things to take into account are the trigger, the data, and the actions that will be executed. The trigger is going to be what initially triggers the integration to occur. It is essentially what we are waiting for to execute what the integration has been programmed to do. Some examples of this are a file integration, so a file being dropped into a directory, a database integration, or a web integration, which of course would be receiving a web request. Secondly is going to be the data. The data is going to be the format or the structure of the data coming in over the integration or the integration method. There are several and really almost endless options on the data that can be passed through. The important thing, of course, is to make sure that the data structure is consistent. For example, if we decide to build an integration using print command script, we we'll want to make sure that we comply with the syntax moving forward for this integration. Lastly is the action. The action is what you would like or need executed once the trigger has occurred and the data passed. With Bartender, of course, one of those actions almost always ends up being to print a document at one point or another. However, pending the data coming in, you want to just adjust your actions accordingly. For print command script, we'll want to make sure that we select the action that is expecting for print command script. So it'll be a little bit different than just the print command in itself. Another example of that would be if we decide to use BTXML in which case we would execute BTXML. So we'll see how all these come together in the live demonstration portion of today's session, but it's important to understand these three main components of designing and integration. Also incredibly important to understand that a lot of these are interchangeable. For example, you can have a web integration that passes print command script or BTXML, and then the actions are to print the actual label and then perhaps write the data to a file, send back a web request response, or any number of the actions that we have available to us. Today specifically, we'll be building an integration with a database trigger. The data will be the database record set, or the data in that record. And the action that we execute is going to be to print the document. So let's talk a little bit about the integration we'll be building today. In general, an integration waits for an event, and in response to that event, specified actions are executed. A database integration is triggered by data being inserted or changed in a database. Specifically in Bartender's case, the integration service runs the specific actions that, we have, been, that have been pre-configured in the integration when that data change occurs. So one of the reasons one might consider database integration is that it's an easy method to integrate Bartender to an existing environment. Oftentimes the data that is needed to be printed on a label already exists within a database somewhere. What this means is just a matter of requesting a table or view to be created within the same ecosystem for Bartender to monitor. In this scenario, because a DBA or ERP engineer, whatever it may be, owns the database, it's a good vessel for that system and bartender to communicate or integrate with each other. So on screen, you'll see just a few of the supported database platforms. While there are some limitations for some platforms, the database integrations in general function under the same principle. Now that we understand what a database integration is, we'll need to discuss what triggers the integration. We previously mentioned data being inserted or changed is what triggers the integration. These options are called new record detection and integration builder. The four options available to us are as followed, and you'll see them on screen. 
So use all records and remove when done is going to be our first one. Using this method, we'll execute all records in a given database table and then delete the record once executed. You also have the options to copy the data to another table in the same database. The second one is going to be field has an increasing value. This method monitors a numeric field and when a new increasing entry is inserted on the next record, the integration is triggered. The third being that the field has a newer timestamp. This method requires a field containing a timestamp. Every time a newer timestamp is inserted into that database table, the integration is triggered. Lastly, we have the field has a specified value. For this one, we monitor a field for a specific value. Once that value is detected, the integration is triggered. So now do note the detection methods with the asterisks do require the database table to contain a prime key field in order to appear in the option in the UI. If you don't see all the options when you do create your own database integration, that's most likely going to be the case why. In all cases, the integration always brings in all the data of all the fields for that one record. This allows you to use the other fields to do things like select the bartender label, the printer, link up the fields to objects on your bartender label, and we'll see all four options in the integration builder when we actually pull it up. So let's go ahead and begin building our integration. We'll begin in bartender to make sure our label is designed correctly in anticipation for our database integration, and then we'll move on to the actual integration builder portion where we build the integration itself. On screen now, you should see my bartender label here. And what we're going to pay attention to today is going to be all the named data sources that we have over here on the left. So the named data sources are going to be what we link or associate to the fields in our database. Okay, so to make one more, just to make sure that we understand what that process is like, let's go ahead and add one for the store number here. So I'm going to simply double click on the object that takes me into the properties of it. Then I'm going to go into data source on the left. So I'm gonna select the data source that I wanna give a name to. And then on the right, we'll notice the yellow icon to change the data source name. So let's go ahead and give this data source a name. So we'll just say store num and we'll hit okay. And we'll now notice that when we close this properties box out, on the left, we see the actual new name data source. With this approach, another advantage to this as well is there's no complex database connections or anything like that at this level of the design. So you simply tell your label designer, design the label, make it look as it needs to, and simply give everything a semi uh, easy to discover name data source. So as long as the person designing the integration can associate this with the actual store number field, that's all that we really need to be concerned about. So I'll go ahead and I'll make sure that I save my label. This is ready to now move on to the next step. I'm going to minimize Bartender, and I'm going to bring up Integration Builder. So Integration Builder is going to be the tool that you use to build and test the integration. So this is going to be your welcome screen when you first open the application up. What we're going to do is we're going to click on Create a New Integration. The method that we're doing today is going to be, of course, a database integration. So we're going to go ahead and select that and hit OK. Okay, and now we'll see the actual UI that we'll be using to build our whole database. So you're going to start by default on the left here under integrations, under the option new record detection. We're gonna click on that and we're gonna go and click on the setup on the right in the properties. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna establish the connection to that database that we wanna monitor. So let's go ahead and click on the setup You'll notice if you've ever connected to a database before on the bartender label level, you'll notice this is going to be familiar. Today we're going to go with the Microsoft SQL Server. I'm going to hit next. I'm going to select the database that contains my data. I'm going to set my authentication mode 
from one of the two available options. And then lastly at the bottom, I'm going to select the actual database that contains the data that I need. For this scenario, it's going to be label data DB. So we can hit next at this point. We have the option to specify a custom SQL statement or just to use the wizard to select our tables. We'll hit finish on this one. Okay, at this point I've connected to it. These are my connection properties. I verify that it's the right type, the right server, and the right database. Then if I go down to record browser, it's going to give me a preview of the data that I already have in there. So here we see that we have the printer name, the bartender label, the ship to address, and all the other fields that I need. So now do keep in mind that these fields here are fields in my database table that I'm later going to use to link to things like the printer name, the label name, and all those other properties that I need to populate. So let's go ahead and let's hit OK because that does look correct. We'll see that our options change a little. At the top, one thing to note is the pull interval. So this is where you would change those settings if needed. Otherwise, it's going to take the default every three seconds. And then if you scroll down, you'll see what's actually an extremely important setting, which is what we discussed already, which is our new record detection method. So this is where you would select one of the four options. And if again, and if you don't see all four options available to you right out of the gate, it's probably going to be because you need that prime key field. So today, what we're going to be doing is going to be field has an increasing value. I so happen to have a field called SN, or just serial number, that has that value. And then we can either hit find last field, which is going to be the last field, obviously, in that record set. Or we can reset to last value. And at that point, what it's going to do is it's going to obviously print out all records in that sequence. Because I'm just testing and there's only two records in there, I'm going to go ahead and leave it on zero. So when we do go to test and deploy the integration, it'll print out both of those for us so we can get a visual on that. The next thing down that we're going to pay attention to is going to be the actions. So we're going to go to the first one. And by default, of course, you'll notice that you have for each database record and print document. So these are default actions when you create a database integration. For each database record, it's simply put that every time we see a new record, we're going to execute everything below this particular action. In our case, it's going to be print document. So it's just going to go in a loop, and for every record that's inserted or created, it's going to execute that print command for us, that print document command. So let's go through here, make sure that our action is set correctly. At first, at the top, we have our record set source. So we tell it to use a database integration record set. That's correct for our use. We want the data coming in to be used. Or we can use a variable if, if needed. Next down, we have the database fields. So this is where you can set a prefix or postfix or suffix to your actual database fields that you're bringing in. So for example, if you have a commonly used field name that might clash with something else in the integration or rename or overwrite something, that's when you would probably want to use a prefix. Next thing down, we'll go to print document. And then this is where we're actually going to have quite a few things to set up. So if going from top to bottom, first thing to know is, like any action, we can rename this one if needed. Also, we can set the run action behavior. So we, what this means is that we can conditionally run an action based on a variable or just any other data that you have throughout your integration. So if we were to write a conditional expression here, if we needed to do that, this is where we would do it. The next thing down is going to be our document, and then pretty much all the document properties below that. So let's go ahead and start filling this out. I'm going to go ahead and browse for my bartender document. I so happen to have it in my C drive under bartender and bartender files. There's my shipping label. I'm going to go ahead and open that up. 
And then what I'm going to do is, which is a good tip as well to do, uh, is going to import document settings. And what that's going to do is it's going to bring in all the properties such as those named data sources that we created, the printer, and all that associated with this particular bartender document. So we'll go ahead and put yes, that we do want to continue. It'll open up the document, read it, and then import all those settings for us. So now we have all the properties for that document imported for us. If we scroll down, we'll notice that some of the things that got populated are the printer itself, the number of copies, and then what's really helpful to us is going to be the name data sources that we see here. So remember, here's the store number that we just now created. So that looks all good, and the values are all static at this point. But let's go back up to the top, because if you remember, we have fields for all these properties or all these options. So we'll want to actually bring in those fields. And the way that we're going to do that is going to be to use variables. So anytime you see this X, this blue X here, is going to open up the variable selection panel. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to erase the name, the bartender document name. Notice I still have the path name there, so we can have a mix of static and dynamic here. I'm going to click on that icon. The insert variable dialog appears. I'm going to make sure I'm under action. And because we've connected to that database, and because we have the for each record there, we're going to get all the fields. If you notice, these look familiar because those are the fields in my SQL Server database table. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to find the corresponding one. We're going to select bartender label. That's correct. Hit OK. And you'll notice that the, the variable is inserted. So anytime you see any text inside the percents, the two percents that you see there, that's going to be a visual that that's actually a variable. Okay. So the next thing we'll do, just moving on, is we'll do our printer as well, because we have a printer field as well. So we're going to go ahead and set that to a variable, allowing us to dynamically select our printer. I'm going to look for, there we go, printer name, and hit OK. okay and then I'm going to keep on moving down. And then I'm going to do the actual named data sources themselves. So this is where we actually make that link between the named data source in the bartender document and the field that's inside the database. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this ship to address. Again, I see my icon here for insert a variable. I'm going to look for the corresponding field or variable at this point. So looking for ship to address, there it is, and we hit OK. And then I'm just going to keep on doing that for all the named data sources that I have. So now if you also have multiple labels and you follow a named data source scheme almost, if you will, and if you have the same named data sources throughout many labels, you can actually use this for that kind of scenario as well. So as long as uh, ship to address exists and it's spelled exactly the same across multiple labels, you can call this name data source and use that same field in this method. So we're going to again just erase the static values there. I'm going to find my zip and the variables. I'm going to do my store number, which is the one that I just created. in my state, and you'll notice that it's very, uh, you know, very much once you get the hang of it there, it's very much just repeat and repeat, and as long as you set everything up initially, it should all function as expected. And then my city. Okay, so what, we're, what we did here is we linked all those named data sources on our label, and we said that we want them populated now, not by what's on the label, but what's on that record in that field for whatever given record. And obviously that's going to be repeating over and over and probably dynamic. Now, if we had any query prompts or if we wanted to do a database override, this is where we could do that as well. 
we simply check those boxes and those options would be available to us. But for now, we can scroll up and it looks like our integration is set up as it should. And what we can do now is we can click on the test icon on the bottom left here. And we can go ahead and we can test our integration. So ship to name, I got that one wrong. And we would have obviously seen that reflected on the label when it actually printed out. Okay, but otherwise it looks correct there. So we'll go ahead and we'll continue on. Again, clicking on our test icon on the bottom left. Okay, and this is where we're actually going to be testing the integration. So keep in mind, this integration is not yet deployed. So if we were to close Integration Builder at this point, it would actually close and shut down that integration. It is not running yet. So we'll go ahead and we'll go through. We see the status of our integrations and all the details of it. Here we'll see the actions, all the actions that we have for that particular integration. And then lastly, what's really going to be important here, especially while we're still testing to see if we did anything wrong, is going to be the output. So if we did anything wrong, this is where we would see any kind of error messages or warnings that come up at us. So we did set it to zero. Remember, we have two records in that table at the moment. So let's go ahead and start the integration. We'll see the output changing. So it's executing all the actions that we just set. And then if we look through here, we see that, well, first of all, we don't see any yellow or red, so that's always good. And we can go into the properties or into the details of each one of these print documents. And then we can scroll down and we can see all the details of this particular print job. And we should see as well all the data. So here we see that this is actually uh, one of the two records that we have in our database. So it pulled everything in correctly. So it, it worked. And then if for whatever reason we're testing, we hit, we need to replay this or playback, we can click on this icon up here on the top right. So at this point, we're happy with the integration. We've just tested it a few times. It's working. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to save it, and then we're going to deploy it. So let's go ahead and click on the Save icon in the top left. We'll give it a name. And we'll hit Save. And then we're going to click on the ribbon up on the top. And this is going to be under the Home option, and we're going to hit Deploy Integration. We'll go ahead, and if needed, we can give it a name, and we can just say whatever name we need to give it, and a description. Next, we can set what server or PC we want to target this for. So if this is going to go to my local PC or my production server, whatever it may be, I can change those options here. And then the schedule. So if we're not ready for the integration to be deployed yet, we can set a schedule on when it will be deployed. We'll go ahead and we'll hit OK. It'll process our request. It'll open the administration console. It'll start our integration. And at this point, we're running. So let's go ahead and now minimize integration builder. And let's go to the administration console. So this is actually a whole separate application as well, you'll notice. And this is where you're going to do everything like security, your system database, and of course, watch your integrations, your actual deployed integrations. So let's drill into this one, the one that we just deployed. And we see that we have started the integration. We see the status of it up here. Here are the actions for this particular integration. And then we have the messages here. So we see, remember, we have those two database records. We told it to start on zero. So it picked up those two. It executed two print jobs. So now to make sure that we did everything correctly, let's go ahead and let's open up our database. Take a, take a look at it. So here we have the actual database that we're currently monitoring. So we have those two records. Let's go ahead and add another one. Okay, we successfully added another record. If you'll look on the left, you'll see that another print job is being executed. And then now we see that we actually have three records. 
So this one went to San Jose. Let's go ahead and look at our file over here. And we should see that the data reflects what we just print or what we just requested or added to that database. So at this point, I can go ahead and close this out. My integration is now running and I'm able to either minimize or close that out because we are now deployed and we're ready to keep printing. And if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in now and the ones that have already been asked, whenever you're ready, tell her, go ahead and read them off. If the table structure were to change, like a field is added or a column is added to the database, mm -hmm. does the integration need to be adjusted or refreshed or would the integration just pick up that change and pass the data to the template? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And the answer is at the label level, all you have to do is make sure that that name data source exists, the new one. As long as that's a given, then there's no change on the label. As far as the integration itself goes, what I would do is I would open up Integration Builder after you've made the change, and then I would go into the Database Connection Properties, which is that wizard that we went through, and I would make sure that I see the field here as one of the options. If I don't see the field here, I would hit the Refresh Fields, hit OK, make sure everything's linked up, and then redeploy the integration. So it's much less steps than actually going through a connection altogether, and it, this is a little bit more flexible in that sense, assuming that you're you're coming from the you know perhaps a, a commander script or or so type background. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to note that the label design would need to have a name data source as well if that's what you're going to be calling. So there might be a label adjustment that needs to be made. So if you add a um, a state field to the label, you're going to have to have that name data source inside the integration in order to populate it as well. So there was a question about using a stored procedure. So in, in particular, calling a label format with a stored procedure. That would work, that would be fine, but and not just in in that scenario, but in any scenario, the thing to keep in mind is unless you tell the integration otherwise, you're going to be printing out all the records. By default in the print dialog in Bartender, the default is to do a all records. So if you just execute a print job and then every time you execute a print job, that's probably not what's desired. So what I would do in that scenario is regardless of the connection and the type of connection and all that, if you do have a label connected to a database, I would either specify the record under which the, you want to print or create a query prompt in the label and then specify the value in the integration. And I can quickly bring that up as well. So if we go to our print action on the left and we scroll down, we'll want to probably do one of the two. Either the record range be specified by, again, a variable, or we have down here the other option, which is the query prompts. So we would want to call whatever query prompt we've created and supply it with a value so we're not doing a whole database print every single time. When a new record goes in the database, is that a condition for printing? Remember that we're going to set the new detection method. So if a new record is inserted, as long as it meets one of the criteria, and we'll go back to the new detection method here, as long as it meets one of the, the criteria for one of the four detection methods here, yes, that will trigger a new print job. So in my scenario, because I've la I inserted the last value and it keeps incrementing, that's the behavior that I specified, a new record does print a new job. Now, you could have an existing record as well. So for example, if you have a specified field, you selected the last option, and then anytime you want a given record to print, you just change that flag from not printed to print, for example, and we'll notice that change and we'll automatically execute that record. So it's not necessarily just a new record, but also just changing data in that table could it trigger off a print job. Is there an action that can be configured to return feedback about the document print? So one of the things that you can do is if we did a specified value here, 
we can, which is the last option, we can set it to any time we see, again, for the example, print, we can change it to printed. You know, so that would be one way that you can watch and you can see what has been changed or done. The other thing is going to be that you do remember that you have a huge list of actions available to you. We only covered really the simple print or for each database record and print document. You can also output and send any kind of response and build your own custom response using variables and static data if needed. And it would be anything from sending a web request to writing to a file or sending back to a network socket. So you would really want, if that's the behavior that you need with your integration, I would explore the options under the actions and output and see what works best for your scenario, your environment, and your system. And then go ahead and move forward with that. Obtaining kind of a demo license. So maybe I guess just cover a trial in this scenario for administration console and integration builder. Yeah, and that's a good question actually. So anytime you install an instance of Bartender, you have an enterprise automation 30-day trial that includes Bartender Designer and all its companion application. And of course, it also includes the integration builder and the administration console and really everything else that goes along with that. There is one or two small things that you can't really do on that, but for 99% of the users, it's an open, unlimited trial for those 30 days. Does the database you're monitoring with the integration have to be local to the server the bartender integration is running on? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. So for this scenario, I did actually connect to a local database, but really as long as you have access to whatever resource that is, so whatever platform database, as long as you can connect to it and we can read it and we can you know, write to it if we need it, then no, the database does not have to be local at all. What is the important file to back up in Integration Builder in case a PC becomes corrupted? Yeah, that's a good question. So first of all, just to answer your question real quick, is going to be the integration file, which is this sample integration.btin. So what I can do is I can do a file, save as, and I'll save it on my desktop just so we can get a visual on it. So this is going to be the file that contains all your settings. So it's now on my desktop. So this is what we want to back up. Now, one thing to notice on that note is when you deploy an integration, the integration itself in Administration Console is no longer relying on this to exist. So while it is extremely important in case you need to make any changes in the future or you would want to pass this on to another PC or anything like that to back that up, the integration itself is not reliant upon that file to continue functioning. Supported database types, and you kind of already hit on it again, but maybe if we bring up that one more time. Yeah, so I can show the dialog here. So if we go ahead and we just go and add a new record set, here are all the supported database platforms. So some have other functionalities that other don't. And it's mostly going to be the limited functionality ones are going to be obviously the text file and the Microsoft Excel that are going to give you the different experience. But otherwise, for the most part, they're all going to be fully supported with all the options that we saw today. And if you don't see your database here, do notice at the bottom we have the option for the OLEDB and the ODBC connections. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I hope you enjoyed today's session. I hope you have a great rest of your day.